Today, I am sitting down with John Taft. Yes, let's just pause for a second. Taft, in terms of the Taft political family, you know, the president of the United States, William Howard Taft. But one thing you're going to find out today in our conversation is John is absolutely his own man. He was the CEO of RBC Wealth Management, and he's a prolific writer. He's written two books. He is unbelievably active on LinkedIn. The guy does a lot of videos. Go out on YouTube. You'll find a lot. He's also a champion of stewardship and doing right for a client, which in today's environment, and the environment, quite frankly, we've been in in the last 10 or 15 years, is something that we need to hear more of. And one of the things that you'll find is that he is a man of unbelievable character, values, beliefs that really guide every action in his life. Once again, I'm just blown away that I'm sitting down with a great grandson of a president. I'm just curious, like, what is it to grow up a Taft? What is that like? How does that guide your life? Is it something that you embrace or deflect? I'm going to talk to John about that. I also want to talk to him about his really strong beliefs about stewardship and also more broadly. He talks about it in financial services, but he's got some beliefs around things that we should be doing outside of financial services. I also want to talk to him. Um, about kind of a technical topic, but very important. And that is the growth of managed accounts and the new risks that come with it. And then also balancing risk-taking and managing risk. This is actually something that I'm really curious about. As a risk management professional, we talk about how you manage risk, but you know what, listen, in order to grow a business, you need to take risks. We're gonna talk about how you balance these two things. It's that solid ground that I'm talking about. You know, understanding your non-negotiable core principles. If you know what those are, anything is possible. If you don't know what those are, nothing else matters. Welcome to Resilient, where we feature stories from leaders on risk, crisis, and disruption. And when I talk about leaders, I'm talking about CEOs, board members, other leaders, even folks outside of the business world. When I started this podcast, it was all about getting these individual stories because I actually believe through these stories, we can all learn something about resilience. My name is Mike Kearney, a partner in Deloitte Strategic Risk Practice, and I really have the coolest job going out and asking any question that I can think of of these incredible leaders. John, former CEO of RBC Wealth Management and a two-time author. Welcome to Resilient. Thank you. It's good to be here. So, John, one of the things that I I love to do, um, I always start off the podcast with a fun fact, a question. And doing my research of you, it was like the easiest one to come across, and that is you are the great-grandson of President William Howard Taft, who was also a Supreme Court justice and I think was the only president and then a Supreme Court justice after he was president. Is That, that true? That is correct. Also... Uh, governor of the Philippines and put the Philippines on their path to independence. And we're talking governor of the Philippines in the 1800s wow. and secretary of war. Uh, so he had quite the resume of public service. His father was attorney general of the United States and every generation since then between him and me has had somebody holding high elected or appointed office. So when you think back on him, what really stands out? Who well, was he as a man? Well, I, I would recommend for anybody who wants to know the book, Doris Kearns Goodwin's book, yep. Bully Pulpit, which was about Taft and Roosevelt and the Taft-Roosevelt relationship, which will answer your question. Taft was an extraordinarily human and sympathetic character. Uh, when it came to his best friend in the world until they broke up, Teddy Roosevelt, his wife, Nellie, uh, the people of the Philippines. He had a big heart. He wore his heart on his sleeve to his detriment, quite frankly, in public office. Why do you say to his detriment? Well, because uh, even in those days, politics was a rough and tumble sport. And a guy like Teddy Roosevelt uh, did very well with that. A guy like Taft did not. Taft was contemplative, introverted, um, and thoughtful, uh, considerate <laughs> qualities you don't equate with with uh, necessarily politicians. politicians. Yeah. And much more the jurist, which he ultimately became, than the politician. Right. For you personally, what was it like having that as your great-grandfather? Was it something that you really enjoyed? Did you deflect it? Is it 
What was it like for you? Oh, my the Taft family legacy, and really when you when you put it out there, you 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 think of the Bushes, right. the Roosevelts, the Kennedys, the Tafts, major multi generational lineages, and. I'm extraordinarily proud of that. My whole life I've been proud of that, and my whole life I knew it was special. But the key is to tip your hat to, acknowledge, uh, have pride in the legacy without let it without letting it uh, change who you are and without letting it influence what you do right. to be authentic. I was lucky in that my father was more or less a black sheep. He was a nuclear physicist and ended up going into academia in New Haven, became the dean of Yale College. And so I grew up sort of with the best of both worlds. Right. The Taft legacy, but a very distant uh, upbringing that was insulated in many ways from the kind of toxic stuff you see uh, with people who fly too close to their family legacy flame. Right. So when you were young, like what stands out when you're young? Because I actually believe who people ultimately become, the values that they have, the beliefs that they stand for, are oftentimes shaped when they're young. What was your youth like? Maybe if you could just touch on that. Uh, very ordinary. My dad, my dad was a physicist. My mother was an artist. We lived in a small house on the campus of Yale University, and I thought nothing of it. But once a summer, we would go up to a little town in French Canada, La Malle Bay, Quebec. And La Malle Bay was where William Howard Taft bought land and built a house and so there is a Taft compound similar to Kennebunkport for the Bushes or Hyannisport for the, for the Kennedys in La Malle Bay, Quebec. And I would go up there and would swarm with uh, cousins, aunts, uncles. Uh, President Taft's daughter, Helen Manning, was still alive and well and uh, uh, holding court in, her, in, in a home that was built at the same time William Howard Taft built his home. So I grew up around the Tafts. I knew we were special. There was something different. And I would just say this, that I would say this about any family, the most uh, influential rules in any family are, are rules that aren't even talked about. They're just in the DNA, in the air you breathe, in the water you drink. And there were rules which were really that my family expected members of the Taft family to excel in a way that left the world a better place and that just and so it, nobody would tell you that you no, just it knew just it. Yeah. you you looked at the people who were admired in the family they had done that you looked at the people who weren't admired in the family they hadn't done that <laughs> yeah. and my whole life yeah. one, one of my motivating factors was i wanted to live a life that my family would have been proud, proud of. of right that and that motivates me to this very day it motivates the choices i make mm -hmm. about what i do professionally and what i do personally the people i hang out with things i care about any early influencers um, that you reflect on well i wrote about uh, i'm a linkedin influencer and i wrote about my soccer coach growing up who uh and and it had five hundred thousand hits he was the first major uh teacher of soccer to Americans. His name was Hubert Vogelsinger, and he was a force of nature. And anybody who had anything to do with Hubert Vogelsinger to this day would tell you he changed their lives. He was a, an Austrian uh, taskmaster, perfectionist, driven, and the first time I saw him demonstrate a soccer skill, I I was, I was, I knew what it was like to be completely and utterly passionate, obsessed by, and focused on a goal, which is that I wanted to be in the middle of the circle demonstrating for Hubert how to do the things that mattered to Hubert. And <laughs> that's exactly what happened. I ended up writing a, a blog about this, and people just resonated. They, my nickname as a, I played professional soccer as the captain of my high school yep. team, captain at Yale. And uh, my nickname was Little Hubert because, in fact, I so internalized his, his approach to soccer that <laughs> I was a living, breathing example of, of what his method did. And, and, and that was, he was, without any question, the most influential person of my youth. Why do you think, so it's interesting, um, 
the whole LinkedIn influencer thing fascinates me. And, and I think even in our pre-call, I talked about all of the different articles you've written. Why do you think that one resonated with the people who read it more than any other? Well, there have been a couple that just took off. And I would say they're the ones which, where I, which I, um, in which I was most able to tap into something that mattered for me like right. i wrote another one and and i did in the in the in, and they were well written as a result and funny and you know i liked them right. <laughs> the blogs but there that's was, important well yeah, there yeah, it, yeah. it was important i can tell the ones that are going to do okay and the ones that are going to do really well i wrote one about uh warren buffett and he has this construct called a punch card and he's and and his 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 construct is well think of yourself as holding a bus ticket in life with 20 punch holes on it you only get to make 20 trips when hit you know equates in his way 20 big decisions if you mm. if you knew at the age of 18 that you had 20 big decisions to make and only 20 you would evaluate uh those decision points in your life very differently perhaps than you have or did and that one just picked up and people people felt wow that's powerful now at my stage of life i realize i punched a lot of those i was going to say how many of you punched I, so far I, do you I, think? <laughs> so i said in my blog i think i have three punches left, left. <laughs> i just made a phone call where i punched another ticket another hole in the ticket and i know it is it's i took i just used one of my three min remaining punches. <laughs> <laughs> that, so what? maybe reflect on one, maybe one of the previous 17 that was significant. Well, I, I made uh, a decision early on. I wanted to be a newspaper reporter. Right. I was a French and English li literature major at Yale. My senior thesis was on French symbolist poetry. And I worked in, as a journalist, practicing, paid, you know, member of the newspaper guild before, during, and after college. And that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be the Moscow correspondent of the New York Times. I worked for the New York Times as a copy boy right. just a few blocks from here. But uh, I went to uh, cover the rebuilding of the city of Lowell, Massachusetts. When you say the rebuild of Lowell, okay. what was the backstory? Yeah, okay, so Lowell is, a, is one of these uh, northern, northeastern Massachusetts city probably, you know, you can go Worcester, Lowell, Lawrence, Haverhill, right. Lynn, you know, Brockton, seats of manufacturing activity that then just went bust. And it left these burned out mill buildings and uh, empty canals because a lot of this was powered by hydropower. And so th these were tough places. I mean, think Jack Kerouac, yep. think the movie, The Fighter, yep. uh, that type of thing. So I went there and I ended up serendipitously my wife was going to harvard law school i hated the new uh my job at the new york times uh, not the new york times my job at the new york times so i moved to boston and worked for this paper in lowell and ended up covering the revitalization of the city of lowell and it was uh paul songus was the democratic mm -hmm. congressman from then senator eventually presidential candidate with a vision that to this day is one of the most interesting and creative visions anyone has had as to how to turn a city around and I got to cover it and I thought that's what I want to do. That's consistent with my legacy, the Taft legacy. I want to contribute to that. So I left journalism, went to the Yale School of Organization and Management, a conference with, uh, uh, which they just sponsored yesterday here in New York, one of the reasons I'm here, and they, uh, I, I got trained to uh, be effective in the public, private, not-for-profit sectors, mm. which is exactly what I thought w it would take to be effective helping turn communities around. I went to, w and then I moved to the Midwest and worked for the public finance department for a uh, regional investment banking firm, financing exactly the kinds of projects, public projects, that I had covered as a reporter and that I aspired to be part of. So that was a major change for me. And I will tell you, this was a hard thing to do for a kid whose father was a physics professor. My dad believed if you spent one minute of a day thinking about anything related to money, you had wasted your day. Only thing that mattered was the pursuit of the truth. And here I was basically selling out, selling out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Even though <laughs> yeah. I argued with him that it was for the public good, he never truly believed that. <laughs> so was it Yale or Boston? So I know you've uh, gone to Yale twice now. So I went it? to Yale twice, but my, Har my, uh, my high school yearbook says Harvard. 
I got into Harvard, uh, Princeton, and Yale, and uh, I won. I went to Harvard, or I accepted Harvard because I wanted to show my dad I was independent. Uh, took a year off, worked as a newspaper reporter in northern New Mexico, uh, lived on hmm. my own, and about midway through the year said, okay, I showed everybody, you know, I don't, uh, I really do want to go to Yale. <laughs> so I called Yale up and I said, would you still have me? And they said, yes. Fantastic. So, John, you've written two books. Uh, yeah. Before we get into the question, because I have some questions on stewardship, what compelled, like, I think of writing a book as like one of those deeply personal, it takes a lot out of you, it takes a lot of time, you have to have something to say to the public that you believe is unique. What made you write a couple books in the first place? Right. Uh, writing a book is an enormous undertaking, and it is not something anyone should enter into lightly. A lot of people start writing books. Uh, many people don't finish writing books, and of course you have to finish it, which takes a lot of work. And I, in my case, I wrote everything in all the books. I wrote them myself. My newspaper background, my literature background, I've, I love to write, obviously. But the way my first book, which was about the core principle of stewardship, which I equate to my a, a principle that my family has stood for throughout the generations, it grew out of speeches and articles I wrote during the financial crisis that I could tell were helping people navigate through that financial crisis, whether they were clients of our firm who had lost half their savings yep. or they were uh, employees of our firm who were not sleeping at night. Um, I was able to help them by what I was saying, you know, like hushed rooms, could hear a pin drop um, type of responses to what I was saying. And so I thought, well, why not expand that and give broader distribution to those ideas so more people could benefit from them? And that's what led me in the first case to write the first book. So what is an example? So if I'm an investor, I've lost a bunch of money, what would be one of those things that you would say that would make me feel better? Or maybe well, it's not even making me feel better, but more confident about the future. Well, there's a there's a there's a whole chapter on on how to navigate your way through a crisis, and uh, th um, th you know there are two contradictory um, principles. You know, don't just stand there, do something. Right is one, and when in doubt, do nothing is another. They're completely contradictory, but they both apply. So the chapter in the book is about when to do something and when not to do something. Uh, and uh, But what I would say is this, just trying to organize everything that's in the book down to one thing. Essentially, if you are able to perform a, uh, you know, a, the existential act of finding the solid ground that you as a person stand on, if you can find out you know, what, what truly matters to you, what do you care about, what your bottom line is, what your non-negotiables are, you, and, and stand on that, then whether you're an investor or uh, you know, a financial advisor or a CEO of a company, you then have the ability to act effectively in a time of crisis. Hmm. If you don't aren't grounded, if you don't have solid ground to stand on, there's no way you're going to make it through. So that's, that's what has to happen. And for investors, it means, you know, what, what, what is your level of risk tolerance? You know, what is your, uh, are your return expectations? What are the non-negotiables you need as far as outcomes in your life? And you have to understand that you have to arrange your investing life around that, and then no matter what happens, you'll be okay. But if, if, if you don't understand that and you don't know it, then you're going to be lost, uncertain. You're going to act out of emotion. You're going to make very bad decisions at exactly the wrong time. See, where I thought you were going, and maybe this is where you're going with that, um, is that if I've just suffered a significant loss and I'm really reflecting on that, I may get all caught up in maybe the money that I lost. And Is, is what you're saying that you almost need to connect to back to who you are as an individual, almost kind of your core purpose, because that's going to override to a certain degree, um, you know, the, the the monetary loss. And there's other things that matter more in your life. And you need to put it into context so that you can then grow out of that. Well, 
Yes, I, yeah. you said it better than I did. There's a great book um, uh, that I just wrote a blog about. It's written by a guy, and now we're getting a little bit off track, but a, a guy who runs... That's why I love these podcasts. The largest <laughs> Christian financial uh, services firm in the country. It's called Thrivent Financial. Mm-hmm. He used to call it Lutheran Brotherhood. His name yep. is Brad Hewitt, and he wrote a book called New Money Mindset. And essentially, that's exactly what it is. You have to get beyond the mindset and they're in th- where money matters <laughs> because it's money and you have to get to a mindset where money is a tool you use for achieving your life goals right and in in his case the book is about the fact that you know they've done these studies where it doesn't matter whether you have seventy five thousand dollars in the in your brokerage account or seventy five million dollars in your brokerage account when they ask the question how much more would it take for you to be happy? The answer is the same, 25% more than you have. Everybody Irrespective wa- of how much you doesn't have. matter yeah. how much yeah. people have. They want 25% more. Well, that means nobody's satisfied with what they have, right. which means that everybody should be satisfied with what they have. Right. Um, so one of the things that uh, you said um, in one of your articles is that the financial crisis occurred because the industry lost its purpose um, and lost contact with stewardship. Why do you believe that? Why, what's behind that? Okay, so what, well, I believe that one of the contributors to the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009 was that uh, participants in financial markets and in the financial sector forgot that finance is a means to greater ends. Much smarter people <laughs> have said that than me. Uh, Most recently, Robert Schiller in a book Mm -hmm. called Finance in the Good Society. Finance, when it does what society expects it to do, is a mere facilitator. It facilitates economic growth. Financial institutions at their core perform the following function. They connect people who have money, investors, Mm -hmm. With people who need money, corporations, governments, uh, not-for-profit entities, and do so in a way where everybody wins. That's the core function. And manage the risks of doing that. That's the core function of finance. And that's where finance, when true to its stewardship principles, which are uh, effectively managing what other people have entrusted to their care, this intermediary role, when we lose touch with that and what happened going into the financial crisis, players in the financial market started thinking of themselves uh, finance as an end unto itself. The in, Inside of financial institutions, the professionals and the business lines that actually met client needs were lost influence mm-hmm. and business lines like trading, proprietary trading desks, r- risk-taking functions became the heavy hitters in the organizations. Cultures changed. And uh, people in finance, you can just look at it, the size of finance as a a percentage of GDP doubled way beyond what a facilitation role ought to look like. Mm -hmm. And we became an end unto ourselves. And any time you get away from core principles and any time you get away from what your, your purpose in society should be, you get in trouble, well, that's a thing to look for. At any time in finance, are we doing what we should be doing, facilitating economic growth, or are we doing more and different than that? If more and different than that, then the risk meter goes up. Did you feel that at the time? Meaning, obviously, you probably couldn't have forecasted the the crisis. You can feel feel excesses in the making. I mean, a simple example today would be Bitcoin. Right. (laughs) Okay, so you could say now, is Bitcoin fulfilling a you know stewardship purpose in society it could right i mean alternative currencies could is bitcoin at this point it is becoming an end unto itself right yep. and it and is way beyond any uh redeeming social purpose and people are going to get seriously hurt so one of the things we talk a lot about um because in many respects it's similar in a consulting environment because we talk about kind of this whole notion of you know, a trusted advisor, which I think is an overused term. It's a good term, though. What is that? So that's what I wanted to ask. What, is that, what does that mean to you? And, and I think it does go beyond finance. 
but but how do you like what does that look like and what can somebody do to become a trusted right advisor? the the we think about um when you say trusted advisor think about professional so think about lawyer right think about doctor think about uh accountant you know cpa i'm a cpa okay well background. well those yep. are yep. Prof those are professions yep. okay you have professional standards yep. okay you have obligations to your clients which is to put their interest first right and to help fulfill their interests without any conflicts that would uh, color your advice or mm -hmm. professional advice. And um, that should be the construct that applies to financial advisors. But what, what for, for reasons of history, um, financial advice is in the prop process of evolving from what was essentially a sales and merchandising function. In other words, you see it in, you know, the, you know Wolf of Wall Street. What inventory, stocks, bonds, and mutual funds do we have, and who can we find to sell that to? Right. Okay, from that kind of a model today to a more professional model where the financial advisor looks, smells, and feels like a doctor, lawyer, or CPA in their interactions with their clients. Now, first thing that has to happen is for you to serve your client's interests, you have to understand your client's interests. Yep. So when you walk into a doctor's office and say, I want, some, uh, I want some pain medication, they're not going to say, why? Because my leg hurts. They're not gonna write you a prescription for right. pain medication. They're gonna take your history. Right. You know, are you allergic to any pain medications? Have you taken pain medications in the past? Do you have any other, pres you know, you're gonna do some discovery. Well, in finance, that's a revolutionary idea that some kind of discovery process or planning process ought to predate and inform the financial advice that financial advisors give to their clients. What a revolutionary idea. That is an indication that finance is slowly evolving, but we're nowhere close to having fully evolved towards being the kind of profession where investors can trust their advisor to give them conflict-free professional advice. We're, we're part way towards getting there, but we're not there yet. Who was the greatest uh, referral guy in the, in the world was Bernie Madoff, right? right. He would built his business on referrals. Yeah. Everybody trusted Bernie right. until, wow. It's funny because I just reflect on um, what I try to do with my clients and the one rule that I've learned over the years, if I just do the one simple thing and put their interests almost before mine, which obviously in business you're somewhat self-interest, but if you put their interests before you, good things will happen. Maybe not now, maybe not today, tomorrow, but sometime in the future. Absolutely. And it all comes down to that. And that's what stewardship is all about. Absolutely. It's, an, it's, it's the underlying principle behind stewardship is that ultimately uh, you are don't matter. It's the people around you that matter. Right. You know, you have to look beyond your own ego, your own wants, needs, and think about, okay, what can I do to help the people that I care about? And that, that's what stewardship comes down to. And that's what was missing going into the financial crisis. And quite frankly, if I may wax uh, a little bit um, uh, larger, it's what's going on in society today across any number of, uh, of social issues. We have lost the stewardship connection uh, at at a leadership level across society. Yeah, I think one of the questions I was going to say is is I'm not even asking because I don't even know if it's answerable, but is the why? But what what do you think individuals can do? Uh, look look for examples of people who behave um, like responsible stewards. Yep. And you know, in my book, I I talk about the qualities and characteristics of stewardship. You know, humility, mm. foresight. Um, uh, are among them, and uh, uh, there are some basic uh, things you can do, but it all comes down to uh, it, the, the construct. There was a guy named Robert Greenleaf mm -hmm. who came up with a construct of servant leadership, mm -hmm. and the idea was being that any time you're in a leadership position, so you run a division at a company, you're the president of the United States, you're the head of the United Way, I mean, whatever the leadership position is, you, in essence, are serving your constituents. As a leader, it's not about you. As a leader, it's about people to whom you are in some way responsible. So the I, effective leaders think of themselves as servants of their constituencies. 
perform that thought exercise. Who is your constituency, and how would you behave if you were serving them? You've already talked about right. your clients. Right. They're your constituents. How would you behave if you were uh, an effective servant leader for that constituency? And that thought exercise, I think, will help people um, navigate towards a place where they're behaving more responsibly than they might otherwise. Let me try something out on you because I'm going to – raise a concept that may sound like it's at odds, but it's something I've learned. And I don't know if this is one of the things, maybe even more so in general society. Um, but I've got strong beliefs, strong convictions. But I also think back when I was, I don't know, younger, that my beliefs were probably 180 degrees different, or maybe 150 degrees different from what they are today. So one of the things I, I do, and this is what I try to do when I engage with people, um, to be open to new ideas, is that if my beliefs That's could humility. change- That's humility. That's humility. In, in, in the form of you know, intellectual curiosity. It's that I can change. Yes. My beliefs can change. And right. so like if my beliefs can change, um, or if they have changed radically, God, that doesn't sound right. If they change significantly over the last 25 years, they still could potentially change over the next 25 years. So I should be open to new ideas. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you can be open to new ideas and still be true to core principles. Right. So uh, I think the core principles don't change. How you implement, effectuate, live out those core principles will evolve over time. Absolutely. There's, there's something that um, may be a construct that would be helpful, and that, that's this whole idea of eth uh, ethical capacity or moral mm. capacity. So um, there's a lot been talked about and written about is can you teach moral capacity? Can you teach somebody to be a better person? And uh, the answer is yes, you can. All the, all the data says that you can. You right. can, you can um, make people aware of how they're behaving, how they ought to behave better, to behave better. And you can, you can if you will, shift the, their moral capacity up. But that upward shift pales in, co in comparison to the slope of the line, the increase in moral capacity that occurs simply by getting older. The older you are, the greater your capacity for behaving ethically. Why? Because you learn how to suppress your own ego, hmm. move beyond your own interests, and focus on the needs of others and focus outside yourself. You know, it's funny because I was going to go into this and you've answered now the question because I would have, the question I was going to ask is it nature or nurture? And you're saying, well, I bet you would say part of it is nature. Yes. But you can learn it. Yes. And it is a factor of, of aging, I guess, or, it, well, or experience I, maybe is a better way of saying it. I, I look at one of the many ways I'm different today than I was when I was in my 20s, to give your example. And uh, I am not as full of myself as I was back then. <laughs> my wife would say I'm still plenty <laughs> full of myself, yeah. but it's better than it used Too to bad be she's not here we couldn't bring her in <laughs> no you, you, well i won't let her get near a microphone my, my wife would do the same thing um so you talked about the fact that the canadian banking system was much more resilient or was not even much more was really the only resilient system um what do you think contributed to that well there were technical and cultural reasons for it probably three reasons one um canadian regulation was better than u.s regulation Okay, there are only five major institutions in Canada, financial institutions. They're under one regulator. There isn't a balkanized, fragmented right. regulatory system. So they kept their eye. One regulator kept their eye on five entities. They did a better job of that. Right. Number two, um, mortgages. In Canada, leading, and it's still the case, uh, there wasn't a system where mortgages were originated by financial institutions for sale to unrelated third parties. The originate to sale model was the model in the United States, think countrywide. Mm -hmm. And the reason that was attractive is that that's the only way you can get 30 year fixed rate mortgages. Right. Banks can't hold 30 year paper. Right. So in Canada though, there are no 30 year fixed rate mortgages. They're all floating rate. Banks put them on their balance sheet, they hold them. So it was an originate to hold model. So the banks paid a whole lot more attention to the underwriting. Right. The underwriting was more conservative. And when the financial crisis hit, the banks went into the crisis with their mortgage portfolio 
portfolios as a source of earning strength instead of their portfolios as a source of toxic mortgage, uh, earnings weakness. Right. So that was a big difference. But then there is a third reason, and this is critical. It's critical for organizations today, um, and that's culture. Canadians are wired differently. I spent every summer of my life in Canada. I worked for a Canadian bank for 15 years. I married a French Canadian. I know Canadians. They're different in the way they view priorities and the way they view their place in the world. And it is a far more passive, other-centered, um, steward-like perspective on why you're on the planet than we have in the United States. Now, you could say that's good and bad, but the good part is they are wired to be better stewards. There are 40 million people living in one of the largest in land masses in the world. They've got natural resources, water, um, you know, everything they need for the rest of time. The, they just can't screw it up. So the whole concept is don't screw it up. Right. You know, when in doubt, do nothing. Whereas the in the U.S. it's uh, just do it, just do it, you know, or the 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 the, the our our math, you know model of national uh, dynamism is the bald eagle. Theirs is the beaver. What does the beaver do? You know, makes builds builds little wooden bridges and, yeah. and you know and then hides <laughs> and then hides. Right, right. Own hibernation. <laughs> so there's a completely different culture, and it does lead. It does mean that that the they're more conservative. And they, they were better positioned going into the financial crisis than we were. That's fascinating. I don't think, until I did some research on this, I knew what was really going on. Because I've always thought about it as kind of the traditional um, client-broker relationship. But there's this move into, I guess what you're calling managed or advisory accounts. Can you, for a lot of people who may not know what the heck that is or what's actually going on, can you share? <sighs> yeah, it's, uh, I can share. And what's going on is that um, more and more advisors are moving from uh, uh, a business model where they buy and sell, sell stocks, bonds, and mutual funds on a transactional basis yep. and get paid a commission for doing that. And uh, every time they do it, they call up their clients and say, hey, I think you should sell uh, Philip Morris and I think you should buy General Motors. Do you agree? Yes. Okay. Then they buy right. and they sell and they get paid a commission because they're moving from that to a model, an advisory model where they give their money to an advisor, the client does, signs an agreement that says, you have discretion to manage my money. You don't have to talk to me provided you do it the way you say you're going to do it in this agreement, mm -hmm. go ahead. I'm going to pay you an annual fee, and you, you can make as many trades or as few trades as you want, but just tell me once a quarter or once a year how I'm doing, up, down, or sideways. Mm -hmm. What have you done, and how are we doing? Right. So that model is where people are going. That's what's going on in wealth management. What, what's the upside? Well, and, and I could probably conjecture, but I'd like to hear from you. What's the upside for me as the investor, and then the wealth management company? Well, the the reason that the advisory model is gaining, uh, becoming more popular Ooh. is that there is a more rigorous, I'll just put it that way, regulatory regime around the discretionary management of money for clients, as you can imagine. I'm give your money, right. manage it the way you think it should be managed. Well, we got to put some some rules around Absolutely, that. Okay, yeah. so there's a more rigorous set of rules around that. Then, if you're calling up clients, suggesting that they transact, getting their approval, and then transacting. Okay, yep. there's still a regulatory regime, but it's not as rigorous. So more investor, higher level of investor protection, and there's a perception that the advisor, who's paid a fee based on the value of the account that they're managing for the client is on the same side of the table, more on the t same side of the table as the client, and therefore is better aligned with the client's interest than when they're just transacting. I, the, the, my upside is predicated on how well you do. Exactly. Yeah. Your upside, how much you get paid as advisor, is tied to how well the client does. Yeah. So that's why it's moving in that direction. Now, like everything in finance, 
we right. you can take things to a point where it's not healthy. And the truth is, I believe this to my very core, that for anybody with a even a modestly complicated financial situation, there a one size fits all model is not the best approach. Mm. So that discretionary asset management for some parts of your portfolio and for some purposes is absolutely the best approach, but a transactional approach for other parts is a better approach. And when I say better, cheaper and more effective outcomes. So a combination of the two uh, executed by somebody who knows how to do both and knows when to do which so that it best serves your interest, that's the best wealth management model in the world, Absolutely. I believe. It's interesting because in some respects, and maybe I'm drawing an analogy, and I think this does work. It's almost what's going on in healthcare because healthcare used to be almost a fee for service. Like I go in, you do something, it's more of a transactional where now doctors are going to be paid based on ultimately results. So it's inter like it's an interesting parallel that is happening. Yes. To, to the two. Professions are becoming more businesslike. Right. Businesses are becoming more professional. They're converging in the middle. Right. So accounting, law, and uh, uh, healthcare on the one side, financial services on the other side, the models are starting to look the same. Right. And I'm bringing these managed or advisory accounts up because I know that it's a hot topic and there's a lot of considerations for wealth management companies that they obviously strategically um, need to think about today. I also understand I'm probably getting out ahead of myself because this is not my area, but there's a, a Department of Labor rule that either was finalized or is being looked at. What implications does that have for wealth management companies? Right. The so this area is very complicated and i'm sorry to tell you i'm one of the the experts <laughs> on it so but but so here to, we go <laughs> no, no we're no, going to be dude. very simple about yeah. it so think about this think about the holy grail of wealth management regulation the holy grail would be a single standard of investor protection that applied to any type of advice any kind of advisor working for any kind of firm would be held to when they deal with individuals. A single uniform standard of care. Is it more principles based? How do you well, do that? Okay, yeah. so how do you do that? We've been having a decades long, mm. probably multiple decades long debate about how to do that. If you ever had, had something where the devil was in the details, this is it. This is it, yep. But what we have today is something called a fiduciary standard that applies to certain types of activities and accounts. The Department of Labor just extended that fiduciary standard to more accounts, but that fiduciary standard doesn't apply to certain other types of accounts. And what, what, what happened is that the, when the Obama administration left and the Trump administration came in, um, everybody said, uh, we now have three or four different standards that apply to wealth management advice. Mm. This, this is a, more confusing than it's ever been to investors. Nobody understands it. And would it make sense to step back and ask the Department of Labor which regulates certain kinds of accounts, and the SEC, which regulates others, to work together and see if they couldn't come up with something that's a little bit more consistent across all accounts. So that's what's going on real time right now. Do you think the rule will ultimately come out? You say they've I, been working I, on it there for 10 will, years? And, yeah. uh, there's a 100% probability that there will be a more uniformly applied best interest standards. That, that best interest standard, that's what's being used right okay. now. Uh, across all types of accounts in the wealth management industry. And uh, 
that would be a very good outcome if we get there. That would, that would, that would, ev everybody would stand up and salute that. But what we've had is dueling regulators um, stepping on each other's toes and butting in front of line and people doing things they really shouldn't be doing. And it's, it ha hasn't been good for, even though consumer advocates say it has, it hasn't been good for investors. Interesting. You know, I, I actually skipped over that question that I was going to ask you. And it's this juxtaposition of, you know, the digitization of everything. And what I hear you saying is that model still is maybe as important as ever, meaning client to client to client. Yeah, what's going and on? So you, you talked earlier about one way in which the wealth management business was changing, and yeah. that was towards more managed accounts mm -hmm. because it puts the advisor more on the side of the client. Right. We talked earlier about financial services becoming more professionalized. There's no question the advisors today look, smell, and feel more like professionals than they ever uh -huh. have. Yep. The third way it's changing is the technology and the way clients can get advice. So it's no longer sitting at the kitchen table talking to the advisor. They can go into a website. They can go on social media. They can even uh, transact, in some cases, themselves. Move money between accounts, mm -hmm. self-service on, on the firm's website, execute certain kinds of trades without ever talking to the financial right. advisor. Or, if they really want to, uh, you know, get a, get a uh, what's called a robo-advisor, a digital yep. investment advisory, um, uh, account set up for their uh, child so the child never has to talk to anybody and it's just on autopilot, they can do that too. So the digitization of it, financial advice is actually happening alongside. It's not supplanting, it's enhancing, it's enhancing yeah. the individual advisor-client relationship. It's not replacing it by any means. It's allowing the advisor to give their client a better experience. Can you talk about, so um, as a former CEO of a one of the largest wealth management companies in the world. When you think about these managed accounts, and I'm more kind of trying to tap into kind of the strategic mindset. And so if you're kind of on that journey, um, how is it impacting your strategy as an organization? Or what should you be thinking about from a strategic perspective? Uh, well, they have, I mean, so this has been decades in the making. Right. Most firms, large wealth management firms, derive half, 60, even 70% of their revenues from discretionary asset manager mm -hmm. management. They're more investment advisors, they're more portfolio managers than they are the brokers right. of, of old. And th that is a good thing and firms want support that and want it even to continue to do more. Why? Number one, when you're charging a fee on assets under management, your revenues are far more stable. Absolutely. So your ability to plan is and, and uh, predictability goes way up. Number two, it's also the case that firms are able to charge more, believe it or not, per dollar of asset in a discretionary mm -hmm. environment than they are in a, on a commission-based environment. So. Every dollar that you move into a managed account is more profitable, is a good thing. Yep. not less profitable for the firms, despite what everybody says. The third thing, and this is critical, and it's because of the rules that apply and the support that's been put underneath these managed account and investment advisory programs, it leads to better client outcomes. Clients do better in an investment advisory relationship, not all the time, but on the whole, than they do in a transactional mm -hmm. environment. And uh, there are a bunch of reasons for that. So you got, uh, and, and then finally, less litigation. Less litigation, less regulatory risk. So less risk for the firm, more, more stable money, revenues, yeah. higher profitability, better client outcomes, what's not to like. Right. And the industry has evolved to that point. A public keeps thinking of brokers as, you know, unscrupulous merchandisers of unsuitable product. That's not true. It's that model's long gone. Not that there aren't firms out there, bad actors, but 
That's not so. So there's so most of the firms have already migrated yes. to this. Are there any? So when you think about this model, what are the are there any significant risks associated with it? Well, the the, the, the there's it makes it sound so great. I mean, well, yeah. it is it is great actually on the whole. There's something called reverse churning, which the SEC is well aware of, and firms are well aware of. And so let's say I I let's take the simple example. I buy a thirty year bond. And uh, I pay a commission the day one, and I leave it in the account. And my plan is just to let it mature 30 years from now, and I'm gonna I'm gonna wire the principal when it matures to my son, right? You know, for his wedding or house or whatever. Okay. Broker comes along and says, Ah, oh, you know, really would like to have that in a managed account. Why don't you move it over here? And I'm gonna charge you one percent a year. I'll watch after the credit. I'll diversify it into other things. And the SEC said, wait a minute, um, this was fine here. You paid a commission up front. You're going to wait 30 years for it to mature. It's a AAA rated you know, government right, bond. Right. What, what, what is the client What's the purpose yeah. to moving in this account? And right. are you just doing it to earn more money on the, on the assets? So that's a risk. Um, the other thing is, you know, when you, this is the great irony, is I, I actually testified in front of fiduciary standard to Congress. And a, a question I kept getting was right in the wake of Madoff is, will a fiduciary standard for investment advice, uh, I mean for uh, wealth management, will it prevent future Madoffs? Folks, Madoff was a fiduciary. Right. Madoff was operating on the 40 Act fiduciary standard. So no, that by itself won't prevent fraud. So there's still risks that clients, because you're saying, well, no, I'm a fiduciary, clients will forget that there's still risk in a fiduciary relationship Absolutely. if the player is a bad actor. Mm -hmm. So that's a risk. Reverse churning is a risk. And then the, other, the only other thing I would say is that these programs are incredibly complicated. They cost a lot of money to, to build and to run right. And um, you, you do see examples of managed account platforms uh, having significant holes in them, operational and other, because they've grown so quickly. Right. And for the industry, a lot more investment. And, and quite frankly, Deloitte has been talking about that and is talking about it. a lot more investment is needed to shore up the foundation underneath these managed accounts. So let's just touch on, and not a gratuitous call out if Deloitte's been talking about it, but but what are some of the things organizations should do to kind of shore that up? Well, what's happened is, to, so you understand this, is as these programs have grown over time, one uh, uh, application or technology uh, solution has been overlaid on another and they've kind of been stitched together with twine and right. you know w wire and so they're these clunky Rube Goldberg machines that were built for a billion dollars under management now they have 150 billion dollars right. under management and there are gaps of all kinds uh, uh, compliance gaps operational gaps um, uh, they're they're clunky to use, so they're they're execution problems with them, and and you kind of you know, need to go back to the beginning and say, okay, w if we had the perfect platform, what it would look like? Right. What's the difference between that and what we have, and what parts of getting to perfect can we bite off over what period of time with which new applications today? So that's what needs to go on, and and. Um, this is something uh, Deloitte is calling managed account risk. And what is the that? It's just the risk that your platform is not performing optimally for my, the firm or for the clients. My oversimplification is almost, in some respects, the business model to a certain degree has changed, and all of the back end technology and processes need to evolve with it. Especially because I'm guessing there's probably a lot of new regulatory compliance yes. requirements and things of that yes. nature. So. Um, one of the things uh, that you talk about uh, is your grandfather. We haven't talked about your grandfather very much, and you know, the fact that he has stood up for his beliefs. He uh, was unable to get the presidential nod twice because of his beliefs and things that he stood up for. Yes. Can you talk a bit about that, and then I want to ask a question about leadership today. Um, well, uh, my grandfather was known as Mr. Integrity. There is a chapter on him in... John F. Kennedy's book, yeah. Profile and Encourage. Yeah. And he is in there because he was willing. Well, first of all, let's start with the fact that he was the son of a U.S. president. He grew up in the White House. 
So the presidency was his birthright as far right. as he was concerned, and he wasn't um, intimidated willing, by it. Or he wasn't think, intimidated, or? and he wasn't willing to compromise anything for it. In other words, he was uh, he was a person. He he is my example. When I think of what does it look like to live your life true to core principles, Robert Alfonso Taft, Senate Majority Leader, Mr. Republican, Mr. Integrity, is my model. And he was lots of people's model. There is only one congressman with a memorial on the grounds of the U.S. Capitol, and that's my grandfather. It's a 10-story tall bell tower, reflecting pool, statue, and inscriptions from his career engraved in it. It was erected by Dwight Eisenhower. And he is, for many, the greatest legislator in our country's history, and he certainly is for me, because wow. of his principled uh, life and the way he stuck to it. Uh, and it's, it was remarkable. Uh, and he is a model for what is needed today, and he is a model for what is missing today, desperately missing today. He knew with absolute conviction his bottom line principles. So the one he is famous for is equal justice under law. He believed that that is the cornerstone of a free society. Now, after World War II, he felt that principle was being violated by the Nuremberg War Trials. Mm -hmm. He felt that the German generals were being prosecuted based on laws that didn't exist when they committed these horrific acts. Mm -hmm. Ex post facto justice. He felt it, and that was a slippery slope, Right. and he opposed the Nuremberg war, war uh, crime trials. Can you imagine how popular that was? Especially right in after 19, the war, yeah, right. In 1950. Yeah. Especially with Dwight Eisenhower running for the U.S. presidency. Right. He didn't stand a chance. So it's that solid ground that I'm talking about. You know, understanding your non-negotiable core principles. If you know what those are, anything is possible. If you don't know what those are, nothing else matters. Is there, have you ever seen somebody pivot, like somebody that may have found that deeper level purpose yes. throughout their career that are able to find it? Yeah, and it, it, you, people can absolutely have awakenings or transcendent moments or come into uh, a, a uh, enlightened state of leadership, absolutely, of what happens to, uh, you know, wh when, when something happens to them. Now, I don't know if this is going on, but look at John McCain mm. post- the brain, brain surgery. surgery. Yep. All of a sudden, he was saying what he truly felt. Right. Well, why? Because there was some kind of personal event that liberated him to do that. Right. And I've never felt more proud <laughs> of him than I did in those moments. When uh, so, one of the things that we've been talking a lot about at Deloitte um, is this whole notion of kind of strategic risk. And I'm not going to get into all of like the geeky under ele uh, the, the elements of it. But what I'm curious of is as a CEO, not necessarily regulatory or compliance risk, but obviously it was your job to grow shareholder value. You have to take risks in order to grow the business. How did you balance this notion between kind of managing, you know, the risk to the business, the reputation, but then also the whole notion that if I'm not doing things to really uh, dr drive this company forward to grow shareholder value, which requires risk taking in a capitalistic model. How did you balance those? And what I'm trying to do is get in the mind of a CEO as to the way they think about risk at the strategy level. And, and that varies between CEOs. So my, I'm, I come from a, a long line of conservatives, yep. not just politically, but personally conservative. Okay, yep. I'm very conservative. So when I think of risk, I bucket it. And almost like a risk budget, you know, how much risk am I willing to take? Let's say from on a scale of one to a hundred, where a hundred is, blow the place blow the company, up. Yep, yep. You know, am I willing to take twenty-five risk points? Am I willing to take five risk points? Think about, you know, in your own portfolio, what, what are, how much of your portfolio would you be willing to allocate to emerging markets? 
you know, right. or maybe maybe twenty percent to emerging markets would be how much would you be willing to allocate to Bitcoin? Well, maybe one percent of your portfolio. So depending on the nature of the risk, you assign points, and let's say twenty five risk points. Mm-hmm. Why twenty five? Well, twenty five risk points is if I if that twenty five risk points lost a hundred percent, you know, of right. of the value, I'd still have seventy five percent of the firm. It's mm-hmm. not fatal. So don't take fatal risks. Think about risk in terms of risk budget. And then, but then invest 25%. Don't invest 5%. Right. Invest 25% right. in innovative, risky, future-oriented, could blow up, could succeed stuff. And that's de- how much, how, how, what's your risk tolerance? Well, that depends on the maturity of the business you run. It depends on the the shareholders that you're uh, responsible for it depends on your own personality so every everybody is different i would say 25 risk points and then you you don't allocate all of that to one thing and the best type of things uh i think is moderate bets that have the potential for significant upside just make a bunch of bets interesting would you ever so in risk management, we're oftentimes kind of um, tutored to find the risks of making decisions, which ultimately may get to not making a decision. Would you ever think of the risks associated with not taking a risk or not? Sure, sure. I mean, that's the, the let opposite, the yeah. let let the world pass you by risk. Exactly. Yeah, that's a great that, way of saying it. That yeah. and that does happen all the time. In fact, that's probably an underappreciated risk. Although right now with all the technological disruption that seems to be forefront but yeah not not um not evolving and staying ahead of disruptive trends probably is a greater risk today than it's ever been in my career it feels like like more disruptors are doing more stuff to establish businesses today than ever before so one of the things i was going to say i've watched a bunch of videos and i think one of your kind of skills uh maybe your superpowers is the ability to make things and this is i'm serious this is like a skill i think but you you're able to make things simple you're able to convey concepts you know uh really uh detailed maybe technical concepts in a way that kind of somebody like me can can grasp um do you agree with that is that something that you've worked on is that a a skill that you've learned over time yes 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 and yes and i think it's critical i mean first of all i think it's you have to think clearly in order to communicate clearly. Hmm. So if you don't know what, what you're trying to say, there's no way you can say it clearly. Right. It's like that old Winston Churchill thing. I don't, I'm sorry this letter is so long, but I don't have time to write a short one. <laughs> right. You know, so if you can't deliver, make your point in that classic, you know, five floor elevator ride, you know, if you don't have an elevator speech way of describing to somebody what what you're trying to communicate, then then you probably aren't thinking clearly about it. We used to, you know, when I was in the brokerage business, say if, if it if you grow hair on your face. While you're explaining something, <laughs> <laughs> never heard probably that. not probably gonna not. probably not a good idea. So I think thinking clearly is a critical piece of it. And then it's, it's um, if you're a leader, I mean, think about this. Your ability to get people to do things depends on your ability to communicate right. clearly and compellingly. So if you can't do that, how can you be effective as a leader? Right, right. So we built this podcast, Resilient, um, and it was my goal at the time to interview leaders like yourself on crisis, risk, and disruption. And I believe that, you know, when you think of those three areas, it's the resilient leaders are the ones that are able to navigate through the financial crisis or able to move through, um, you know, really significant uh, risk events or, or everything that's going on with all the technological disruption today. But when I talk about resilient and a resilient leader, is there an attribute or two that jumps to the top of your mind and is there somebody that embodies that? Well, there's a great book called Full Catastrophe um, Living, Full Catastrophe mm. Living by John Kabat-Zinn, who's a Zen um, guru. And the, the concept is, uh, comes from Zorba the Greek, actually, that all this stuff is going on around you. 
and things are bouncing and blowing up and, you know, sometimes more than others. So you're living a full catastrophe. And the idea is to build a little roof and go into yourself and go to that quiet core spot and touch base with that. And everything that's going on around you will look very different, more manageable. You will be more resilient if you're able to do that. And that's John Cabot Zinn's version of my solid ground, my core principles. So what resilience is about is being in the middle of all the noise, nonsense, emotion, crisis, confusion, chaos, to go to the place where you are standing on solid ground. And then no matter what you're dealing with, you can deal with it. That's that's what resilience that for me is all about. That may be the best answer we've ever gotten. Um, what I love about that, because what you're really getting uh, into is that uh, cri- life is going to happen. Yes. And it's a way to navigate through that life. Through life. It's, it's almost not even resilience per se. It's about the way you live your life. So resilience would be the thread through your entire life right. versus an act, which I think oftentimes people think it's like something bad happens and you demonstrate resilience. Yours is almost a way of being. Correct. Which I would have to say I aspire to and don't always demonstrate. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, you uh, left RBC in 2015, and one of the things that you've begun to appreciate are some some maybe emerging topics that you've gotten a lot deeper in. I think you talked about like AI and robotic process automation and things like that, but you, I think you were almost reflecting like, wow, I wish I actually spent a little more time diving into this as a CEO. And I guess the question I would have for you is, you know, as a former CEO, if you were to either go back or if you were to have advice for other CEOs, um, what would be your guidance to them in terms of learning about what's going on, you know, in the world while still obviously meeting your commitments that you got? Right. I, and this is going to sound uh, uh, happy or, or self-serving, but honestly, I would sign up for uh, the kind of labs that yeah. Deloitte offers to executives and leaders. Yep. In other words, what I'm realizing is, and, and you're, you're running your business, you're consuming intellectual capital, you're not creating it, and you need to sort of force feed uh, yourself right. opportunities to take stuff in. But um, when you're running a business or you're, you're in a leadership role corporately, it's, it's hard to just set aside the time to read through stuff. So going into a one or two day lab where you have people who are expert in a range of topics, you pick them what they are beforehand, just like you said, like artificial intelligence, feed me everything in the next hour and a half, right. high level, executive, You know, just tell me what I need to be aware of and thinking of in artificial intelligence. Now let's click over here. Feed me you know, uh, on, on this topic, stuff I wouldn't run into every day, but that I need to be aware of to be more effective. I would do labs and I would expose myself more intentionally and more regularly to things I don't know about or understand about. And I would use professional help to do that. Yeah, and it's funny because I think one of the things we're running so hard that to get a day, let alone right. an hour, is so difficult. Right. But to kind of make that commitment, I don't know, that 5 or 10% commitment is critical yes. when it comes to planning your life yes. and making sure and prioritizing I would it. do more of that. That's interesting. So a couple final questions. I always like to call this the dessert. Um, I hate to ask, like, what is your favorite book? Because obviously you rattled off a bunch. But is there one that you would say, once again, it's not necessarily a favorite, but one that maybe um, has impacted you in a way that's nudged your personal improvement or done something that has made a you know, meaningful impact in your life? Well, there are. I I, I knew you were going to ask me that question because you tipped me on it, and I don't. <laughs> I've, I've, there are hundreds of books I thought were impactful. I, I you know, I'm I'm gonna, one comes to mind, and it's the biography of Warren Buffett. It's called The Snowball. Yeah, he is an absolutely extraordinary human being, a completely ordinary, extraordinary human being. And can you pause on it because you just said ordinary, extraordinary? Yeah. So what well, do you, there's I, nothing. I mean, on the one hand lives in omaha nebraska right he by the way his grandfather was my grandfather's campaign manager oh that's fascinating it was robert taft's campaign yeah. manager and we've talked about that yeah. he and i so 
there are many ways in which his life is completely ordinary. He eats McDonald's and diet co- drinks Diet Coke and you know goes to the office every day, has the same routine, so forth and so on. On the other hand, um, his personal life is way out there in some ways, uh, and his he has he has like this you talk about superpowers he has this superhuman i call it uber common sense mm. that he's had a single concept which he's executed over the course of decades and i i think he's a fascinating person and so i could i could mention a hundred books but the the snowball the is snowball. what it's called biography of uh, Warren Buffett would be one I'd recommend to people. So maybe this isn't another curveball. Um, any question that you've never been asked, but you've always wanted to answer? Okay, no, but here's a question I would like to ask and have the answer to. Okay. And it's a question my father, the nuclear physicist, asked me. And they're related, actually two questions. The arrow of time is one of the only things in existence that points in one direction. Time only moves in one direction. Why? And do you think time has an end? And if not, why do you think time had a beginning? Had a beginning. And those two questions <laughs> are the kinds of dinner conversations I had growing up. I don't know the answers, and I think they hold the meaning of life. So thank, thank you. you John. Well, it's John. been a pleasure. Yeah, this has been awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to Resilient, Deloitte's podcast produced by Rivet Radio. You can find us by going to Deloitte.com or visiting iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google, Spotify. Spotify, who knew that so many podcasts were on Spotify, but actually we're getting a lot of uptick there. I'd also encourage you to check out our previous episodes. And the one that I've been getting a lot of feedback on, positive feedback, is my conversation with Jake Wood, the CEO of Team Rubicon. Also check out an oldie but goodie, Bill Roper, CEO of VeriSign. Bill is an incredible man, has an incredible story about the crisis he led VeriSign through. And if nothing else, he's got like the best radio voice I think I've ever heard. If you like these conversations, please do me a favor and just share them with your friends and colleagues at work. You know, the way that we get noticed is through ratings. So if you have a moment, just go out to any one of your podcatchers and just give us a little rating. Um, I would definitely appreciate that. Finally, and my favorite ask is hit me up on social media. LinkedIn especially. I've been getting so much engagement on LinkedIn. If you have any recommendations for future guests, if you have any comments on what we've been doing, or if you just want to connect. I like connecting with people, and I promise you I will reply. So if you want to connect with me, my profile on LinkedIn is under Michael Kearney, K-E-A-R-N-E-Y, or on Twitter, mkearney33.